a sea lion trainer. <laughs> but that's not what my talk is about. It was 1999, and I found myself seated across from three very grizzled police veterans. It was the first time that I had uh, spoken with police officers when they weren't asking me for my license and my registration. <laughs> The first one said, why do you want to be a cop? And then the second one followed with, and you can't say to help people, which really sucked because that was my answer. <laughs> I bumbled through the rest of that interview answering questions like, what's with all the speeding tickets? I sheepishly replied, at least you know I can drive fast. <laughs> there were psych tests, physicals, drug tests and a polygraph, and I asked, does it have a setting for Catholics? <laughs> the answer is no. And I've had three polygraphs, I've told that joke every time, and never has a polygraph operator laughed at that. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you. With all that done, my background check was complete and I found myself at the police academy where I learned about handcuffing and laws and how to shoot guns and drive fast, which we all know I already knew how to do. <laughs> but what it didn't prepare me for was all the trauma that I was going to see and experience once I was out on the road. I'll never forget my first domestic violence arrest. A man had hit his wife so hard in the face he split her lip open. So when I asked him about it, he denied it at first, and I questioned him, and he finally admitted to it, so I arrested him, and I put him in the back of my cruiser, and I felt like I am making a difference. I'm, I'm finally doing the thing I signed up to do. My sergeant rolled up, and he said, what happened? And I told him, and he said, uh, good job, Dick Tracy, but it doesn't sound like rocket science to me. And I felt deflated, but what he was really trying to say was, get used to this. This is everyday stuff for you now. Just do your job and move on. And I understand that that's about survival. But what I realized over time was some things are not that easy to get over and you can't just move on. You see, the average person, and not that you're average people, you're obviously above average. <laughs> you're at a TED talk. But the average person will witness or experience three to five traumatic incidents in their whole lifetime what we would call critical incidents. The average police officer over a 20 to 30 year career span will experience hundreds of these incidents. For me and for others, they're like little pebbles being thrown into an invisible backpack that you would carry throughout your career. And over time, it got quite heavy. But I was a cop now, and I was supposed to just soldier on and do my job. And there was gallows humor to help me with that, that that's why God made whiskey and duct tape, because whiskey will numb your pain and duct tape fixes everything. <laughs> As if trauma is like walking off a charley horse, and if you just rub enough dirt in it, you'll be fine. You see, in policing, if you speak up about your doubts or your pain, you're gonna be labeled. You'll be stigmatized and ostracized. You are definitely not gonna get promoted. As if the man who would run toward gunfire is courageous and brave, and yet that same man who walks toward a therapist's office is somehow weak. I had a sergeant who told me after really hard calls and a tough day, he would buy a six pack and he would drink it to help him sleep at night. And I thought that was a terrible idea. And then one midnight shift, I found myself called to the local hospital where I dealt with a really heinous crime against a very young child. And I had little kids and it bothered me. It bothered me for the rest of my shift. And that morning I bought a six pack and I drove home. And I sat in my daughter's room and I watched her sleep in her crib and I drank beer. Every police officer can tell you the story about the one call that really got him, and that one was mine. I had barely two years on the job at that point. Over the next 20 years, I realized just how much the police culture had absorbed these messages we get as young men. To man up, toughen up, play through the pain. Boys don't cry because crying's for girls. The worst part was, all the domestic violence cases I went to see, it was as if these little guys who learned to solve problems with their fists had grown up to be grown men who did the same thing. You see, when you don't have a healthy way to experience, deal with, and express your emotions, they'll come out in very dysfunctional ways, sometimes violence, but also as substance abuse, depression, suicide, and a litany of other things. 
as I managed my way through the rest of my career with some highs and some lows. I realized that the field I was working in was not adequately set up to help officers who are struggling or in need. That if I broke my arm or my leg, I would get 12 weeks off and nobody would question that. They make jokes about it. They say you went and saw Dr. Summer off or Dr. Winter off. <laughs> but when it comes to your emotions and your psychology, there's not a lot of room for you. And you're often left wondering, do I speak up or do I keep my job? The problem with playing through that kind of pain is it just causes more damage. That cost isn't just in hiring and retention, where the average career span of a police officer is less than three years. They pack it up and say, this isn't for me. I don't blame them. But I've seen many of my colleagues who have been hidden, assigned to special units where their careers go to die. Some who had once been jovial, wonderful people become quite miserable and suffer in silence. And sadly, some others have died by suicide. The silence and the bravado around this is literally killing us. In 2020, 89 police officers died in the line of duty. Every year, two to three times as many will die by suicide. Two to three times as many police officers will take their own lives. It was a statistic I found staggering and unacceptable, and I hope you do too. Toward the end of my own career, I was struggling. It was hard. I had a lot of stress, and so I decided I should go talk to somebody. So I made an appointment with a counselor, and I went and I, I talked to this poor woman who I spilled my guts to. And she said, you know, John, it sounds like you have left your heart, your mind, and your soul out on that field, and maybe you ought to think about retiring. And I told her I felt like I was a quitter if I did that. I was giving up. And just by being in this office, I felt like I was sliding my man card across the table to her. And she said something that changed me forever. She said, you did the most courageous thing possible. You asked for help when you needed it. I began to see trauma very differently from there on and started to learn about it. I learned that there's something called post-traumatic growth, where you can go through hard things and with the appropriate early intervention and treatment, you can come out stronger. There is strength and resiliency to be found in doing hard stuff but it takes the courage to speak up. It takes departments who are willing to listen and provide the treatment and resources and support necessary for those officers. We shouldn't wait till the end of a career or when things are dire for people to get help. See, when you retire, you're gonna hand in your gun, your badge, but that backpack with those little pebbles that now feel like boulders, you're taking that with you when you go. Policing is at a crossroads, obviously, if you've watched the news. And I don't blame those old, grizzled veterans for doing things the way they did them. When you're taught to ignore your emotions or compartmentalize things, that's exactly what you do. But I believe that police officers deserve an opportunity to have healthy lives and healthy careers. Healthy public servants will make healthier decisions with the communities that they're called to serve. Public service is a social determinant of public health, meaning that the healthier your public servants are, the healthier your community will be. We do a great job teaching people the hard skills of policing, how to shoot and handcuff and all that stuff. But what we don't teach are the soft skills of empathy, emotional intelligence, communication, critical thinking about our beliefs, our experiences, our emotions, how to handle them, what to do with them, there's no requirement that this be taught. There's no standard for proficiency. You certainly don't have to qualify it on every year. And yet these are the very skills that will keep you healthy and mentally fit. So what if we stop labeling people as weak or broken and we start seeing them as courageous and smart enough to get the help that they need? that we recognize and acknowledge that seeing that much trauma and not having a healthy way to deal with it is just not normal. We can take the shame away from needing therapy and just look at it as necessary maintenance. Create some room to listen to those police officers who are struggling instead of sending them away to deal with their stuff and provide them with the space, the resources that they need to get their careers back on track and be able to go back to duty. Recognizing that leadership is not about holding power or about giving commands. Leadership is about taking care of the people who are entrusted to you. That the police officers who are taking care of themselves and each other 
are gonna take better care of their communities, we need to reward those people, promote those people, because they are the future of policing. What if we just recognize that in order to protect and serve, we need to first start by protecting and taking care of our mental health? I teach classes in this now. Me and my friend Doug, we work with departments, officers, their supervisors, to just normalize this and take the stigma away and think about things differently. And departments are starting to do that. There's some who do things like peer-to-peer -peer counseling. Others are being a little more innovative. They're teaching meditation to police officers. You have to tell them that snipers do it, and then they'll do it. <laughs> but it's a start, right? So others are doing things like requiring that everybody from the chief of police down to the brand newest patrol officer go see a therapist or a counselor one or several times a year. That way, everybody does it, it takes the stigma away, and it's normal. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so the feedback has been encouraging and it's been wonderful. The officers that are doing this tell us that not only did it help them do their jobs better, but it fixed their marriages, it improved their relationships with their children, they became better brothers and sisters, friends, that they're finding strength in their relationships with one another. And instead of white-knuckling it through hard times and relying on rugged independence, they're finding strength in their interdependence with one another, because interdependence is a different kind of backup. I stand by why I became a cop, and it was to help people. What I didn't know is that I was going to have to learn to ask for help, and that one of the most important skills I was going to need was to be able to take care of my own mental health and well-being in order to be a really good cop. So whether you're a cop or not, the one thing I want you to take away from this is that when you go through hard times, and you all will, don't be afraid to raise your hand and ask for help because it's the most courageous thing that you can do.